In November of 1868, at the tender age of 15, John Wesley Harden killed his first man. And a few weeks later, he'd kill yet again. This time, three soldiers who came hunting after him. Fearing a hangman's noose, Wes struck first, dispatching two of the troopers with his shotgun and finishing off the third with an old cap and ball colt. And believe me when I say the hits just kept on coming. Before it was all said and done, Harden would be responsible for anywhere between 20 to possibly as many as 50 killings, each of which, according to him, were justifiable. But how true is that? Was John Wesley Harden a persecuted hero or simply a homicidal killer? How the son of a minister turned out to be one of the deadliest gunmen of the Old West. And did he really kill someone just for snoring? My name's Josh, and you're listening to the Wild West Extravaganza. John Wesley Hardin was born near Bonham, Texas on May 26, 1853. His father, James, a Methodist preacher, was what folks back in them days referred to as a circuit rider. Rather than tending his own congregation, the Reverend Hardin would move extensively throughout the state of Texas, helping to open and close churches and sometimes even schools. He'd moved the family down to Polk County when John Wesley was still a baby, and just a few years later, move yet again, this time settling just outside the now ghost town of Sumter, not too far from present-day Groveton, Texas. And it is there in Sumter where young Wes Hardin would spend the next several years. In many ways, John enjoyed a normal childhood. He received an average, if not above average, education, while also spending a good deal of time out in the woods, just hunting and fishing and otherwise having a good old time. Be that as it may, Hardin did seem to have a propensity towards violence even at an early age. Once, while attending school, Wes pulled a knife on a teacher. On another occasion, he put the blade to use during a brawl that saw him nearly kill one of his fellow classmates. And of course, we can't discuss violence to John Wesley Harden without also touching on the Civil War, a conflict that, to quote Cormac McCarthy, filled the country with violent children orphaned by war. Now, even though none of Harden's direct kinfolk were killed, the war did have a deep and long-lasting impact on the young man. According to West himself, he grew up an ardent rebel, seeing Abraham Lincoln burned and shot to pieces in effigy so often that he looked upon him as the devil incarnate. Somewhere around the age of 9 or 10, Hardin even tried running off to enlist with the Confederates, but his daddy found out and gave him a thorough attitude adjustment. By 1865, the war was over and Texas was plunged into Reconstruction. Something I will touch on more in just a bit, but for now I'd like to take a look at Wes's first killing in the fall of 1868, just six months after his 15th birthday. The youngster was paying a visit to his Uncle Barnett's place just north of the town of Livingston, where he and a cousin took to wrestling with an older and larger black man by the name of Major Holshausen, Mage for short. Now there's no indication that this was anything other than a friendly grappling match, but at some point things took a sour turn. The boys, Hardin and his cousin, got a little too rough and drew blood. This angered Mage, and he took to threatening the teenagers before being ordered off the plantation. The next day as Wes was on his way home, alone, he spotted Mage on the trail ahead carrying a large stick. Now to hear Hardin tell it, Major then began cursing him up and down and even tried to grab hold of his horse's bridle. Left with no choice but to defend himself, young John then shucked an old cap and ball six-shooter and emptied it into the former slave. But is this what really happened? There wasn't but two people involved, John and Mage, and Mage obviously wasn't talking. Now don't get me wrong, Hardin did kill the man. That much is undisputed. The question is, was it truly a coincidental meeting with Mage as the aggressor, or did Wes purposely hunt the man down looking to set things right after the previous day's tongue lashing? There's also a third possibility, one which I will expand on later, but there is a chance that someone else put Wes up to the killing. Which brings us to a huge disclaimer. Nearly all of the information we have on this period of Hardin's life comes from him, as told in his autobiography. The Life of John Wesley Harden. I think by this point, whether you're a longtime listener to the Wild West extravaganza or just an Old West history buff in general, I probably don't need to tell you that these autobiographies ain't the most accurate of sources. As far as Wes Harden is concerned, the man had a tendency to justify each and every one of his killings. In his mind, he was never in the wrong and simply acting out of self-preservation. Or at least that's what he wanted others to think. Many of John Wesley's killings are proven. He was the real deal Holyfield when it came to Old West gunslingers. There's absolutely no denying that. 
but there are also more than a few deadly confrontations where Hardin remains our only source. I will use John's own words throughout this series, but it's worth keeping in mind that a lot of his stories cannot be corroborated. Now, directly following this killing, John fetched another one of his uncles, Claiborne Holshausen, who incidentally was the former master of the dead mage. For whatever reason, Uncle Claiborne slipped West $20 and told him to run home and explain what happened to his daddy. Per Hardin, the killing of a black man, quote, meant sudden death at the hands of a court backed by northern bayonets. Hence, my father told me to keep in hiding until the Yankee bayonet should cease to govern. Thus, unwillingly, I became a fugitive, not from justice, be it known, but from injustice and misrule of the people who had subjugated the South, end quote. So yeah, even though the war's over, there is no love lost between John Wesley and the Union authorities. For the next six weeks, Hardin would lay low about 20 miles to the north, where his older brother Joseph was employed as a school teacher. The Yankees soon came sniffing around, though, and West decided to meet the trouble head on. This is that little fight I alluded to in the intro. Armed with a double-barreled shotgun and a Colt 44, Hardin waylaid the soldiers as they were crossing a creek. Two of the men were dispatched with that scatter gun as the third, a black soldier, attempted to flee with Wes fast on his trail. Hardin demanded that he surrender in the name of the Southern Confederacy, but when the brave trooper refused to throw his hands up, down he went. Years later, when recalling the incident, Hardin would write, quote, I have no mercy on men who I knew only wanted to get my body to torture and kill. End quote. Local farmers would help to bury the bodies as John once more went on the lamb. It's time to his Aunt Susanna's place on the outskirts of Corsicana. And this next part is damn near unbelievable, but as crazy as it sounds, West then took up employment as a school teacher, just like his older brother Joe. Dude was still just 15 years old. <laughs> Already had four bodies to his name, and somehow he's put in charge of molding other young minds. Hell, some of the students were even older than he was. Now, Hardin would only spend a few months teaching before moving to his uncle Alexander's place up in Navarro County, where he helped to work cattle. Started palling around with his older cousins, William and Alec Berkman, and also developed a fondness for gambling that would plague him for the rest of his life. Story goes that Wes would bet on anything. Horses, poker, hell, he'd even wager over who could spit tobacco the furthest. This is also when he began spending time with another cousin named Simp Dixon. Allegedly. Now, Simp full name Jonathan Simpson Dixon, was about five years Hardin Sr. and an active participant in the infamous Peacock-Lee feud further up north. According to Hardin, the pair were riding east of Corsicana when they was waylaid by soldiers. John managed to kill one and simp another before the rest decided to call it quits. Once again, much like Hardin's previous clash with those soldiers after killing Mage, this is another unverifiable story. There are no military records indicating that such a fight occurred. I'm not saying it didn't happen, I'm just pointing out there's no evidence other than Hardin's autobiography. By late 1869, Hardin and his brother Joe would be in Hill County, Texas, visiting various family members. Wes also claimed to have been speculating in cotton and hides and, quote, playing poker and seven up whenever I got a chance and once in a while I would bet on a pony race, end quote. Now, a lot of this gambling took place at the old Bowles racetrack which incidentally is now currently under Lake Whitney. Nonetheless, it was there on January 4th, 1870, where Hardin would take yet another life. He entered into a private game of poker with several locals, two of whom were Benjamin Bradley and Judge Moore. Wasn't long before they began arguing over cards. Seems like Wes was always arguing over cards. And Bradley pulled out a knife. Hardin, at the time, was both unarmed and barefoot, believe it or not. He had apparently made himself comfortable, and his pistol and boots were sitting in a corner beyond reach. There was a brief scuffle, but Wes escaped, sans pistol and boots, and began searching frantically for a gun. Finally, one of his cousins secured a revolver just in the nick of time. Benjamin Bradley came in hard and guns a blazing, and Wes shot him deader in hell. Now that's Wes's version. Sometime later, a witness would state that while Bradley and Hardin were indeed drunk and arguing over cards, they had calmed down before going their separate ways. Later that night, Hardin spied Bradley all alone, called out his name, and when he turned, that's when Wes filled him full of lead. Whatever the case, one thing's for certain. Benjamin Bradley was no longer among the living, and John Wesley Hardin was once more indicted for murder. He would next seek refuge at his Uncle Bob's farm just outside of Brenham, but would kill twice more on the way there. Good lord. 
The first incident occurred at a circus outside of Horn Hill, when, according to West, quote, I accidentally struck the hand of a circus man who was lighting his pipe. I begged his pardon at once and assured him it was a pure accident. He, however, just roared and bellowed and swore that he would smash my nose. I told him to smash and be damned and that I was a smasher myself. He said, you are, are you? And then struck me on the nose and started to pull his gun. I pulled mine and fired. He fell with the forty-five ball through his head. End quote. The second killing happened in the town of Cossie, where Hardin decided to partake in a little female companionship. Just as he and the working gal were getting cozy behind closed doors, here comes a guy claiming to be her husband, busting in and demanding a hundred dollars. Oldest trick in the book, right? Wes complies, making believe that he's scared as all get out, and with trembling hands, tosses a wad of bills at the man's feet. As soon as the would-be thief bends down to pick it up, Hardin retrieved his revolver, and blam! Another one bites the dust. Now, I know it's hard to keep track, but if I'm not mistaken, that's killing number eight for Wes Harden. Remember, he's not yet 17 years old. Finally, by the end of January, Harden arrived at his Uncle Bob's farm, where, according to him, he became a good plowboy and a hoer. That's H-O-E, as in the garden implement, E-R. Ho-er. Hoer. By the way, if you're wondering just how many damn cousins and aunts and uncles John Wesley Harden had, I can assure you it was a passel. Even nowadays, you can't walk 10 feet in Texas without bumping into somebody who either claims to be kin to him or Quanta Parker. Or both. Unfortunately, Wes just wouldn't stay put on his uncle's farm. Started spending more and more time in nearby Brenham, hanging out with an older gambler by the name of Phil Coe. And when the Texas State Police got a little too thick, he backed up and headed some 40-odd miles west to the community of Evergreen, a town that was full of what he described as hard characters. Guys like Ben Hines, who had previously been indicted for aggravated assault on a child and slashing the throat of a deputy sheriff. But since this was Texas in the 1870s, Hines was still a free man. One day there in Evergreen, Ben grew agitated after Wes beat him for a large sum of money during a rousing game of 7-Up. As Hardin tried to leave, Hines said that if he weren't so young, he'd whoop his ass. Wes replied that Hines should not, quote, spoil such good intentions on account of my youth. Hines then made a move, acting like he was going to strike Wes, so Harden whipped out his revolver, saying that he was a little on the scrap himself, but the only difference between him and Hines was that he used lead. As you can imagine, this sufficiently took the starch out of the older man, and, according to Wes, he began to apologize profusely. Later on that day, Harden would beat another young, up-and-coming Texas gunslinger by the name of Bill Longley. Things were tense at first, but the pair spent the rest of the evening playing poker and parted, not necessarily as friends, but at least civilly. I do have an entire episode devoted to Longley if you'd like to give it a listen, link down below. He and Harden would quarrel in the near future, but this was the only time they would actually meet face to face. Now this was in the spring of 1870, right around the time that Harden was hanging out in Evergreen, his parents moved to the tiny hamlet of Mount Calm, just northeast of Waco. Wes would pay them a short visit, but he'd soon be on the move again, drifting east to Longview, Texas, where, in January of 1871, he found himself arrested on charges of horse theft and murder. Imagine that. Now, Harden doesn't really go into much detail on the charges in his autobiography, other than, of course, claiming that he was innocent. Remember, Wes Harden was never at fault. He was always just a victim of circumstance. While in jail there in Longview, he somehow managed to get his hands on a loaded revolver and tried talking his fellow inmates into helping him murder the guards. They declined, so the young killer just bid his time. Soon enough, an opportunity presented itself. Harden was told he was being transferred to the jail over in Waco, so as he was getting dressed, he just slyly hid that pistol up under his left arm. Now, there were three officers escorting him to Waco, Police Captain E.T. Stakes and Deputies Anderson and Jim Smalley. The party reached the outskirts of town without incident on January 22nd, and as Stakes and Anderson went to a nearby farm to procure feed for their horses, they left Smalley and Harden all alone. Big mistake. According to Wes, Smalley immediately began threatening to kill him. Faint in fear, Harden laid his head against a horse and pretended to cry, all the while fishing that revolver out from underneath his arm. Once in hand, he turned to Smalley just as the deputy was going for a gun of his own. You can probably guess what happened next. Harden would later write that Smalley died, quote, because he did not have sense enough to throw his hands up at the point of a pistol. Remember what I said earlier about Harden always spinning these killings in a way to make it seem like he had no other choice or that he was just always justified. 
I mean, sure, maybe he was under arrest, but here's this Deputy Smalley trying to kill him. What else was he supposed to do? Well, as it turns out, there was an eyewitness, an elderly woman, and her claims don't exactly jive with John Wesley's version of events. According to her, Hardin shot Smalley in the back. When the wounded deputy then turned and frantically attempted to pull his gun, West shot him once more in the belly before hopping on a pony and making his getaway. John's next stop would be his parents' house, just 20 miles to the northeast, where the Reverend Hardin gave his son a fresh mount and began pleading with him to go to Mexico. Wes agreed, but these plans were soon thwarted. Quote, I left my father's home bound for Mexico. I was going by way of San Antonio, but was arrested between Belton and Waco by men calling themselves police. End quote. Now, these so-called police, going by the names of Smith, Jones, and Davis, would proceed to get drunker than Cooter Brown later on that night as they made camp. Once again, according to Hardin, quote, they agreed that Smith should stand first guard, a man named Jones second, and Davis the last watch. They had a good deal of whiskey with them, and they all got about half drunk. I had concluded to escape at the first opportunity, so when we laid down, I noticed where they put their shooting irons. I did not intend to sleep, but watched for a chance to liberate myself from unlawful arrest. End quote. Sure enough, an inebriated Smith soon began nodding off. Seizing upon the opportunity, Wes grabbed a nearby double-barreled shotgun, along with a revolver, and opened fire. He emptied one barrel into the head of a still-sleeping Smith and the other into Jones. By this point, Davis had jumped up, so Wes switched to that pistol and fired until he was, quote, satisfied he was dead. Now, believe it or not, Hardin would then turn around and go right back to his parents' house, once again attempting to explain what had happened. I gotta wonder how that conversation went down. Hey, Mom, Dad, uh, you're gonna want to sit down for this one. Where to start? Where to start? So remember the other day when I killed that guy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, uh, you're not going to believe this, but I did it again. Mm-hmm, yeah, only this time it was three guys. Totally not my fault, though, I swear. Now, to the reverend's credit, he flat out told Wes that he did not believe his bullshit explanation. Nonetheless, he once again urged his son to flee to Mexico. And this time, just in order to ensure that no more accidental killings occurred, the elder Hardin would even accompany Wes on the first leg of the journey. After about 60 or so miles, the minister turned back home, and not long thereafter, John had a change of heart. Instead of continuing to old Mexico, he chose to make a detour and visit cousins down in Gonzales. His Aunt Martha was married to an old boy named Emmanuel Clements, and several of his sons, especially Emmanuel Jr., known as Manon, John, who went by Gip, and Joseph, would factor heavily into the next chapter of Hardin's life. According to him, quote, I told my relatives I was in trouble and on my way to Mexico. They told me I could go to Kansas with cattle and make some money and at the same time be free from arrest. I therefore concluded to give up my Mexican trip and went to work helping them gather cattle. Now you would think that with Hardin being on the run and all, he'd play it cool, just lay low and avoid trouble. But alas, that was not to be. In February of 1871, he and his cousins visited a camp of Mexican vaqueros and began gambling. Apparently, Hardin wasn't familiar with the slightly different rules of Spanish Monty, and he thought one of the dealers was cheating him. Wes pulled a gun as the man tried to explain, but it weren't no use. He began to pistol whip him, and when two bystanders pulled out their knives looking to intervene, Wes shot one in the lung and another in the arm. Quote, We all went back to camp and laughed about the matter, but the game broke up for good and the Mexican camp abandoned. The best people of the vicinity said I did a good thing. End quote. No idea how either one of those vaqueros fared, but one would assume the lung shot man later died. If this incident truly occurred, then by my rough estimate, that brings Hardin's body count up to 13. Finally, the cousins, along with Wes, signed on to drive several thousand head of cattle up north to Abilene, Kansas. Now, this would normally take anywhere from two to three months, as the cowboys pushed the herd up through Texas and Indian Territory before arriving at the Kansas Railhead. Only thing is, many of the tribes along the Chisholm Trail attempted to extort tolls or payments from these cow outfits passing through their land. A proposal that Hardin relished, stating, I was just about as much afraid of an Indian as I was a raccoon. In fact, I was anxious to meet some on the warpath. And to hear Wes tell it, he'd soon have his wish early one morning on the South Canadian River. He was in the process of hunting turkey when his horse began acting nervous. I looked in the direction that he seemed to be afraid of, and about 20 yards off, I saw an Indian in the very act of letting fly an arrow at me. And quick as a thought, I drew my pistol and fired at him. The ball hit him squarely in the forehead, and he fell dead without a groan. 
Now, once again, just like with a lot of these killings, you do have to wonder if this is really what happened. If it even happened at all. You know, was Hardin really defending his life, or did he just assume that any indigenous he encountered was a threat and thus dispatched the first one he saw without hesitation? A ways on up the trail, the outfit would encounter even more natives, the Osage. At first, they demanded a toll, and when that was refused, they simply began taking cattle. They even came into camp one morning while Wes was away and stole his silver bridle. As you can imagine, this didn't go over too well with Hardin, so he rode out to confront him. Quote, They came up in a body and demanded cattle again. I told them no, as I had before. An Indian rode into the herd and cut out a big beef steer. I told him to get out of the herd and pulled my pistol to emphasize my remarks. He was armed and drew his, saying that if I did not let him cut the beef out, he would kill the animal. I told him that if he killed the animal, I would kill him. Well, he killed the beef and I killed him. The other Indians promptly vanished. End quote. Now, after shaking the Osage, the herd pushed north into Kansas, where, as fate would have it, West would see him in his reputation as an absolute stone-cold killer. The story goes that another herd, driven by Mexicans, began crowding West's outfit from behind. He and the other Texans had already warned this bunch to keep their cattle back several times to no avail. The Mexican trail boss, a man known only as Jose, began tearing into Hardin's crew and telling them to move with Hardin yelling right back, saying for them to go the hell around. This infuriated Jose, and he began cursing Wes. And if that ain't bad enough, he soon turned to go fetch a rifle. I guess if Wes wasn't going to move that herd, by God, Jose was going to make him move it. Sure enough, here he comes walking back with that rifle in hand, making a beeline straight for Hardin. And once the pair were about 100 yards from one another, they began trading bullets. Jose firing that rifle and Hardin an old worn-out revolver with a wobbly cylinder. Quote, there was so much play between the cylinder and the barrel that it would not bust a cap or fire unless I held the cylinder with one hand and pulled the trigger with the other. I made several unsuccessful attempts to shoot the advancing Mexican from my horse but failed. I then got down and tried to shoot him and hold my horse but failed in that too. Jim Clement shouted at me to turn that horse loose and hold the cylinder. I did so and fired at the Mexican, who was now only ten paces from me. I hit him in the thigh and stunned him a little. I tried to fire again, but snapped. The Mexican had evidently fired his last load, so we rushed together in a hand-to-hand -hand fight. End quote. Wasn't long before Jose's friends arrived, looking to shoot Wes, but with him and their boss rolling around in the dirt, couldn't nobody get off a shot. Finally, here comes cousin Jim Clements rushing in and breaking up the fight, telling the Mexicans that both Hardin and Jose were drunk and didn't know what they was doing. Okay, cool. Crisis averted, right? Well, not so fast. Inebriated or not, once Wes was back in camp, he armed himself with a much more reliable pistol. Just in time, too, as Jose was coming back for more, this time bringing several of his amigos with him. Not one to wait, Hardin mounted a pony and charged, one of his bullets catching Jose square in the chest before he turned his attention to the others. By this time, Cousin Jim had joined in on the fight and they rode straight at the Paqueros, holding their fire until, quote, We were in the middle of them, dousing them with lead. They willed and made a brave stand, but we were too quick for them. A few more bullets, quickly and rightly placed, silenced this party forever. End quote. Noticing that the remaining Mexicans were headed their way, Hardin gets the bright idea to stampede their herd by shooting a steer in the face. This dissuaded most of the Baqueros, except for one brave soul who kept on a charging. Hardin, quote, ended his existence by putting a ball through his temple. End quote. But it wasn't over yet. Wes and Clements would go chasing after the now fleeing Mexicans, and the first group they caught up with immediately threw their hands up and said they had enough. Okay, fine. They let them be and went after the other two. These old boys likewise said they was done fighting, but I guess they had a change of heart and ended up going for their guns. Harden shot both of them, one in the chest and the other in the lung. Jim Clements was also able to put a bullet in the second man, but he was still alive and pleading for him to stop shooting. Per Wes Harden, quote, I could not shoot a man, not even a treacherous Mexican, who was begging and down. Besides, I knew he would die anyway. In comparing notes after the fight, we agreed that I killed five of the six Mexicans. End quote. Now, like I said, despite Wes having already racked up quite the impressive body count, it was this skirmish that really made his reputation. And unlike many of those previous battles, this one did have a ton of witnesses. Hell, there was already a crowd of curious cattlemen present from neighboring herds even before the last bullet was fired. 
And in the days that followed, as news spread, many others would pay Wes a visit, looking to meet him and shake his hand. Harden even earned himself the nickname Little Arkansas on account of the shooting taking place on the Little Arkansas River. I think the only thing in dispute is how many men were actually killed. According to an article published a week later in the Wichita Tribune, it was only three. That said, there are numerous anecdotal stories backing up Harden's claim of six. By the way, just an FYI, Wes and the herd would arrive at Abilene a few days later on June 1st, 1871, a mere five days after his 18th birthday. Assuming that this fight occurred prior to May 26, which it likely did, that would mean that this little bastard, by his own admission, had killed damn near 20 men before he was even 18 years old. Remember, we can't verify them all, but Wes, for sure, by this point, had already killed Major Holshausen, Benjamin Bradley, Deputy John Smalley, and at least three of these Mexican cowboys. You gotta assume he inflated his body count, right? Literally everybody did back in those days. But you also got to think there might be a kernel or two of truth in a few of these stories. Some historians think that Hardin was responsible for even more killings that he never fessed up to. For instance, I mentioned a judge more earlier when we discussed the shooting of Ben Bradley. Well, apparently more went missing shortly thereafter. Then, in 1872, a Texas Ranger captain would sign an affidavit swearing that Hardin confessed to killing two men in Hill County around 1869 or 1870. That was before this cattle drive. One of those men was Bradley, and the other, according to historian Chuck Parsons, was most likely this Judge Moore guy. Furthermore, some of the deaths that would occur in the upcoming Sutton-Taylor feud also had Wes's handiwork written all over him, shootings that he himself would never admit to. Whatever the official count, there's just no two ways about it. Wes Harden was an extremely dangerous, volatile young man who had absolutely no problem whatsoever when it came to taking a life. And trust me when I say we're just getting started. Still got three more installments left in this series on John Wesley Harden. So please, do whatever you gotta do. Subscribe, turn on your notifications, set a reminder on your phone, get a tattoo, write it down in your calendar, whatever. Just make sure you check back in next week for part two. Trust me, you're not gonna wanna miss it. We'll be taking a look at Wes's time in Abilene, his famous confrontation with Wild Bill Hickok, And finally, once and for all, we're going to put to rest whether or not he truly killed a man for the grave offense of snoring too loud. If you're looking for more true tales from the Wild and Wooly West, head on over to wildwestextra.com. While you're there, hit that contact button. Let me know what's on your mind. All right, till next time, try not to bump into anybody at the circus, okay? Don't take your boots off when you're gambling. And please, whatever you do, do not name your kid after a famous Methodist preacher. It never ends well. Adios.